Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our regular New Zealand-based um, journal club for the people who works with all the types of extracellular vesicles. Today, we're going to learn more about placental vesicles um, from Sandy Lau, Dr. Sandy Lau, sorry. Uh, Sandy is a research fellow uh, who works at the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology in the University of Auckland. Uh, Sandy, do you mind if uh, the questions will come through the chat or you prefer to answer them uh, after your talk? Um, I, I don't mind either way. Um, I've only got one screen today, so um, feel free to stop me if you would like, but then I, I, I can't actually see the chats coming through. Yep, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so feel free to post your questions as we go and we will read them and ask Sandy questions. Um, thank you, Sandy. You're uh, welcome to share your screen. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, hopefully this is working. So um, I'm interested in what placental extracellular vesicles do in pregnancy and in the uh, pregnancy specific disorder, preeclampsia. Um, this project is a, a collaboration uh, between the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology and the Department of Physiology. And we have a one, um, as well as the Institute of Ligands, um, we have a wonderful team. Um, so today I'm presenting research on behalf of myself, Carolyn Barrett, Katie Groom, Chi Chen, Larry Chamley. Um, so what do you consider a successful pregnancy? Um, ironically, when you Google what a successful pregnancy is in Google Images, you get all these advertisements about what isn't a successful pregnancy. Um, this is after a couple of scrolls, this is one of the photos that came up. What I consider a successful pregnancy is one where firstly you have a viable fetus, um, hopefully that child grows and lives to a very ripe old age, um, and more importantly that the pregnancy doesn't cause any detrimental effects to the mom, mother's body. So she can go on and have more successful pregnancies and more children. Um, so what needs to happen for uh, successful pregnancies to occur? Well, the maternal cardiovascular system needs to uh, make adaptations, not only in her cardiovascular system, but her entire physiology. And that is a, a collaboration between the fetus the placenta as well as mum's body. So it's more like a dance, a tango, where both sides have to be going in the same direction, but also at the same time. What changes um, during pregnancy and how do you su support a successful pregnancy? Well, by term, um, by conservative estimates, a fetus and its placenta weighs about three and a half kilos. So a fetus, uh, sorry, the baby's about three kilos, you get a placenta that's about half a kilo. So that's actually a substantial amount of tissue. If you take um, one of our largest organs in the body for comparison, our liver, our liver only weighs about 1.5 kilos in a 70 kilo male. So it is a substantial addition of tissue. And to support this, uh, the blood volume has of mum uh, has to increase from six to eight weeks of pregnancy, such that by the third trimester of pregnancy, your blood volume would have increased by 45% compared to your pre-pregnant levels. And that's approximately to about five liters of blood. Um, and the blood flow to the uterus to support this pregnancy increases from about 2% when you're not pregnant to about 17% of mum's blood going uh, to her uterus. So with the 45% increase in blood volume, what has to change? Well, um, you need to at least be pumping that 45% of uh, blood volume around and you can see um, that the cardiac 
output or the amount of blood passing through the heart um, in liters per minute increases um, to its maximum in the second and uh, early third trimester. Um, but what's interesting is that if you consider, for example, your garden hose where you've blocked off one end and you're keeping and you keep pumping more water into your hose, eventually you get a lot of pressure and your hose might burst. Um, but what we don't see with this increase in blood volume is we don't see a deep a increase in vascular resistance. Um, the circulatory system is kind of like a, uh, is a closed system similar to our garden hose, but instead of seeing an increase um, in blood pressure in response to the increase in volume, what we're actually seeing is a decrease in blood pressure um, and towards term, no change in blood pressure at all. And that happens because there is a decrease in systemic vascular resistance at the same time, which compensates for this. So going back to the garden hose, if you're able to increase the diameter of your hose, you're not gonna get um, that buildup of pressure. So that's what happens during a healthy normal pregnancy. But what happens when you're, um, Maternal, when the maternal vascular resistance doesn't decrease or decrease enough, you get a condition called preeclampsia. Um, it's specific to pregnancy. Um, and what we do know is that the, uh, there are early onset uh, forms and late onset forms. Um, and the early onset preeclampsia, it's associated with a very poor uh, fetal and maternal outcomes. So what sort of outcomes are we talking about? Well, women with early onset preeclampsia are more likely to die 10 years um, earlier uh, compared to their uh, an uncomplicated pregnancy due to um, cardiovascular disease complications. Their babies are from a preeclamptic pregnancy are more likely to develop uh, childhood hypertension and childhood diabetes, and they're typically born smaller. Whereas the late onset form, um, the outcomes are better. So you don't see that, that 10 year decrease in uh, expected lifespan. Um, the different, one of the Differences in the etiology of early onset preeclampsia versus late onset preeclampsia is that we believe that there is an initial insult to the placenta uh, during the implantation phase, which isn't necessarily the same for, always the same for late onset cases of preeclampsia. But regardless of your um, etiology or your onset category of preeclampsia, Preeclampsia is triggered by something that is released from the placenta, so it can occur in the absence of a fetus, for example, in hydrated uh, moles or cancers of the placenta. You can still get preeclampsia without having a fetus, um, and this trigger results in an increase in vascular resistance overall, which we saw in the previous slide, a decrease in vascular resistance is important for a normal pregnancy. And these uh, changes occur via effectors such as uh, changes in the nitric oxide system. Angiotensin II is also one of um, the, implicate, the pathways implicated in, in preeclampsia, as well as endothelin I. And what we also see is a change in the central nervous, nervous um, control of vessel tone via changes in sympathetic nerve activity. So, uh, these are the potential effectors of preeclampsia. Um, so we believe um, in our lab that uh, EVs from uh, the placenta actually may, uh, in a preeclamptic uh, pregnancy, may actually contribute to the, the pathological development. But first, we needed to look in the literature to see, actually, is this uh, belief or hypothesis even a possibility? And what we can see in the literature is that if you harvest um, EVs, uh, plasma EVs from Worcester Kyoto rats, 
and uh, put them in blood vessels, that actually EVs have a capacity to change um, the vascular resistance or the contractile responses to blood vessels, such as it can uh, change the uh, acetylcholine mediated um, vasodilation. And that same group has also shown that um, if you harvest uh, EVs from um, hypertensive patients and put them in um, arteries from mice, you get you still get a reduced um, acetylcholine mediated vasodilation, but actually the effect is different from um, EVs harvested from uh, normotensive patients. So actually pathology EVs do have um, an effect, may have differences that leads to differences in, in effects. Um, what our previous work in our lab has also shown is that if you take nanovesicles from first trimester placenta and you inject them into pregnant mice, you'll also see changes in acetylcholine, acetylcholine mediated vasodilation. So this is all peripheral evidence that um, isn't directly from uh, preeclamptic placenta. So what is there that suggests that um, it's worth looking at in preeclampsia? Well, uh, we've seen that um, placental EVs um, have vasoactive proteins in them, such as nitric oxide synthase, which is important in vasodilation. And um, in preeclampsia, these placental EVs uh, show a decrease in function of nitric oxide synthase. And that there is some evidence that the uh, cargo that is being carried from early onset preeclampsia uh, EV, placental EVs are different from normal tensive EV, uh, normal pregnant placental EVs. So there is um, a fair bit of evidence out there that suggests we should be looking. So the aim, overall arching aim of our work is to determine whether placental EVs from preeclamptic placenta um, affect vascular resistance in uh, mouse arteries differently compared to if the vesicles were taken from normal placenta. And we hypothesize that the EVs from preeclamptic placenta induces that sort of uh, contractile proconstrictor phenotype in the blood vessels that we see in women who have preeclampsia. So what did we do? Um, this is just a quick reminder for those who don't actually work with um, placenta is that uh, like other cell types which release uh, microvesicles and nanovesicles, um, the placenta also releases it as well. But the human placenta is unique in that it has, it's covered by a single um, multinucleated cell layer called the syncytiotrophoblast. And because that cell, multinucleated cell layer is in direct uh, contact with maternal blood, it can re release a third type of EVs, um, which we called uh, macro EVs or syncytial nuclear aggregates. And they are on the larger uh, spectrum, so they can be anywhere between 20 to about 400 micrometers in size. Um, so to harvest our uh, EVs, what we did was take a third trimester placenta. We have the tissue explants cultured overnight in um, these uh, essentially uh, sieves called net wells. Um, it's an established method uh, in, our in our laboratory. So afterwards we take the uh, culture media we spin it down at 2000 G um, for five minutes to get our macro vesicle uh, fragment of macro vesicle group um, sample. We then take uh, that supernatant, spin it again at 20,000 G's for 60 minutes to, re uh, to isolate the micro vesicle samples. And uh, that supernatant is then uh, spun down one last time at 100,000 G for 60 minutes to um, collect our nanovesicle samples. 
So um, after we've isolated these uh, vesicles, approximately 100 micrograms of protein of micro nano vesicles um, and approximately four explants worth of macro vesicles are injected um, separately into different pregnant mice at uh, approximately day 12.5 of gestation. So we leave these, leave these vesicles circulating in the mice for maybe uh, 30 minutes, sorry, for 30 minutes or 24 hours. So there would be different groups. Um, after the time point, these mice are euthanized and we uh, take blood vessels from the um, small intestine mesentery tissue um, because it is an easily accessible um, capillary bed, um, or sorry, artery bed, as well as um, it is considered one of the vessels that are the size that determines vascular, 50% of vascular resistance in humans. So we take a second order um, vessel then we load the vessel into a machine called a uh, wire myograph. Now, all it does is there is a pressure, sen a force sensor on this side. And when you load your vessel through with two 25 micro, uh, micrometer tungsten wires, it, um, it, when the vessels contract, it uh, induces a force that gets picked up. Um, by the uh, by the wire myograph. So we're looking um, essentially at measurements of contraction and relaxation. So uh, once we've collected our vessels, we uh, first check that the vessels are working, that I haven't damaged them in the collection and loading process. Um, so we do a drug independent contraction. So blood vessels um, re contract with, uh, through changes in uh, calcium. So when we put a high potassium solution in, it changes um, the calcium intracellular calcium content and that leads to a contraction. There are other ways of inducing contractions like with drugs. So we also check the drug dependent contraction with uh, phenylephrine. And also um, we check that there is an intact endothelium. Um, so we pre-constrict these vessels and we put in acetylcholine, which affects on the endothelial cells, uh, resulting in vasodilation. Um, so once we add it in, we see that there is a, uh, if endothelium is intact, we can see a decrease in, um, in vessel, to, uh, ves vascular contraction, vessel contraction, um, returning to baseline. So after we've checked that our blood vessel is uh, healthy, what we do is we then look at a number of um, vasoconstrictors uh, that are st either standard to this method of assessment or they are implicated in preeclampsia. So vasoconstrictors, we have um, phenylephrine, which is an alpha adrenergic receptor antagonist. Um, and actually, it, the relevance of this is current treatments for preeclampsia, uh, treatment of symptoms of the high blood pressure in preeclampsia, such as labetalol, uh, tries to uh, reduce the effects um, of these alpha adrenergic receptors. Um, we also look at angiotensin II, which is a vasoconstrictor peptide implicated in the cardiovascular changes in both in normal pregnancy and preeclampsia. We also look at um, the dose responses to endothelin one, which is um, a vasoconstrictor that is one of the effector endpoints of multiple hypothesized um, etiologies and pathologi uh, pathological development pathways of preeclampsia. So these are our main vasoconstrictors that we look at. And we are also looking at vasodilators such as um, acetylcholine, which um, when you add it into endothelial cells, it leads to the down uh, downstream G 
generation of nitric oxide via um, endothelial nitric oxide synthase and sodium nitroprusside, which is a nitric oxide donor. So essentially what these two different vasodilators do is um, break up the nitric oxide system asking, hey, can we generate nitric oxide in these blood vessels versus can we respond to nitric oxide in these blood vessels? So um, in the next, I don't know how many, 20 slides, we'll be looking at some of the Y myography data. Um, and what we have done um, is taken that blood vessel, we've gotten the maximum uh, KPSS or non-drug induced response um, to get a, to normalize as a baseline, because if you take vessels of different sizes, um, they have different amounts of uh, smooth muscle around them and therefore its maximal response will be different. So we're normalizing against that to be able to compare um, between uh, groups and within groups as well. And with each of our drugs, we uh, incrementally increase the concentration to get a drug dose response curve. And then we try and fit the curves with a nonlinear regression. And what it tells us is this first p-value, are the curves or the treatments different? All it's telling you is, hey, um, are you seeing an effect between groups? But then that didn't, ooh, some things are missing. Oh, there we go. Um, so it doesn't actually tell you um, what is different, like how is the response change? Is it more, is the maximal response different or is the minimum response different or is actually the sensitivity shifted? Um, so we did a sub analysis where we're just comparing the maximal um, response, sub analysis when we're comparing the minimal response and another one when where we are comparing the sensitivity between groups to this particular drug. So um, if it's significant, you'll see uh, stars being placed at these appropriate areas. So the exciting parts, are the results. How does placental EVs affect vascular reactivity in pregnancy? So before we can answer what does preeclampsia uh, due to placental EVs and how does blood vessels react to them, we really need a baseline. What do uh, normal placental, third trimester placental EVs do um, when injected in uh, pregnant mice to their vascular responsiveness? So uh, if we don't dive straight into the results. If we pause for a second, um, you will see that uh, the groups that I have are the three macro, micro, nano vesicles that you can obtain from um, a placenta. Um, each of each mouse uh, only receives one treatment. So this is six mice, seven mice, six mice, and a separate group of six mice have uh, received a um, injection of control vesicles. Now, what was our control vesicle in this instance? Um, remember back in the methods, I said that we use culture media to culture our placenta overnight. Now this culture media uh, contained 2% FBS, and we know that there are ample amounts of uh, serum, sorry, ample amounts of EVs uh, in serum. So it means that there could potentially be a trace of fetal bovine serum derived EVs um, in isolated samples. So to get this control, what I did was take 12 mils of culture media, which was the same amount of culture media um, I used to collect my macro vesicle for one injection in an animal. So I take my 12 mils, I spin it down at 100,000 G, and then I inject essentially whatever was um, in whatever was spun down uh, into these animals and it really was a trace we weren't um, we weren't able to see any palette whatsoever it was um, washing essentially um, the centrifuge tube to see what we can get out of it um, so the controls not only serve as a control for the presence of contaminating um, FBS-derived vesicles, 
it also serves as a control of what the uh, va the maternal vasculature is doing at day 12.5 pregnancy in these um, animals. So into the results, at 30 minutes in response to our chosen vasoconstrictors, phenylephrine, angiotensin 2, and endothelin 1, what we saw was a uh, that firstly, that there is an effect, the direct effect of placental EVs on maternal vasculature. So it can change how uh, the maternal vessels react to stimulation with drugs. But also at 30 minutes, all, uh, all three samples of macro, micro, and nano vesicles directly in, uh, resulted in an increased response to vasodilators. So, uh, sorry, vasoconstrictors. It's a typo there. So the berry uh, dark pink colored is our control. And um, we can see that there is an increase, uh, a increase in um, the response. And in our sub-analysis, what we saw was at the in response to phenylephrine, not only did it um, have a different maximal response, but the sensitivity to phenylephrine has changed as well. So that is what the effect of placental EVs from normal third trimester placenta have um, on blood vessels after 30 minutes. Um, what about 24 hours? So at 24 hours, um, there is actually no longer a difference in phenylephrine uh, response or angiotensin response. Um, but what we did do see is, um, if you look here, the berry colored line is our control, is that we get a decrease in the maximal contractile response to endothelin one. What, um, and the sub-analysis showed that um, the maximal response is statistically significant. So placental EVs are reducing the maximum contraction that you can get from endothelin one. Um, in this uh, testing scenario. So that's vasoconstrictors, but what about vasodilators? What is the response to that? So back to 30 minutes, um, acetylcholine, which uh, induces vasodilation via um, generation of nitric oxide, sodium nitroprusside, which is equivalent of dumping nitric oxide into the system. Um, is that in acetylcholine at 30 minutes, there is no difference in the generation of nitric oxide in blood vessels in, um, in the different groups. However, um, in response to sodium nitroprusside, we do get a different response um, in uh, the nitric oxide donor, but the response appears to be mixed. So if, the, if you look, the control line is sitting in the center and um, nanovesicles appear to increase, enhance vasodilation in response to sodium nitroprusside at the lower end or the minimum dose, whereas microvesicles tend to attenuate that um, response until almost at the 50% uh, um, uh, sorry, the equivalent of the EC50. So, and the lower doses, it tends to attenuate the response. And um, it's interesting because um, what would the overall effect have been if I didn't uh, separate the micro and nanovesicles? Because we know that approximate equal amounts of nano and microvesicles are released from the placenta. Overall, do we get a uh, no response as well? Um, I'm not sure about that. But what about the short-term responses, the 24-hour responses? Um, so interestingly, the difference disappears at 24 hours when sodium, uh, so in response to sodium nitroprusside. Um, but what we see is a um, increase in the maximum uh, relaxation in blood vessels um, at signal uh, through ACH. So we've got the um, berry colored line here, and then we can see that our, at least in our macro and our nanovesicle groups, you can have a larger um, relaxation, well, larger relaxation response um, 
which is significant at the maximal doses. So if we tried to answer the question, how does placenta levies affect vascular reactivity in pregnancy? Um, we can say firstly that there is a direct effect that uh, placental EVs do affect maternal uh, blood vessels um, when you stimulate them to contract and to relax. And that the acute 30 minute response appears to be possibly be pro-constrictive, which is not necessarily um, what we would have expected. But the short term effect supports that um, our, uh, our hypothesis that placental EVs may be contributing to the more relaxed vasculature that we see in normal pregnancy. Um, we can see that via a uh, reduced contraction to endothelin 1 and increased relaxation to acetylcholine. Um, but generally to the other three uh, drugs that we've tested, there are no responses. So um, the response so it doesn't seem to be um, a huge response as well. And it could possibly be because we're using third trimester placenta. Um, and remembering that um, the cardiovascular changes in pregnancy, um, normal pregnancy, a lot of it starts in first trimester and it reaches its maximum in sort of mid second to uh, late second trimester. Um, I wonder whether or not actually the effects of vesicles will be different depending on which um, trimester you take the placenta from. And perhaps that uh, when you, the changes are more drastic, you may be able to see a more drastic effect. So we, now that we know sort of what we're expecting from um, normal third trimester placental EVs, how does that response change um, in preeclampsia? Does the preeclamptic placenta produce aberrant EVs that result in um, the increased vascular resistance and hypertension that we see in preeclampsia? So what um, we've done is we've now got three uh, groups, an early onset preeclampsia group, um, so women, placenta from women who um, delivered and had early onset preeclampsia. We have uh, a group where the placenta were from late onset preeclamptic pregnancies and um, a normotensive group. Now the normotensive group, um, please bear in mind, is a, uh, is a repeat of the data that you've just seen. So I've taken the normotensive data and plotted it against the early and the late onset data. So, um, so it's slight, the format is now slightly different. We are looking only right now at the 24 hour um, treatment group. So these vesicles have been injected into the mice, left to circulate for 24 hours before the mice were euthanized and the blood vessels taken. Um, and we've got macro, We've got animals injected with macro vesicles, we've got animals injected with micro vesicles, and we've got animals injected with nano vesicles. These are all different animals. And the separate um, ends in each group will be at the bottom of the graph. But what we can clearly see from this is that um, the in response to phenylephrine, uh, blood vessels from mice who have been injected with vesicles from early onset preeclampsia showed an enhanced response uh, to phenylephrine um, and when they received macro vesicles, when they received micro vesicles, and even when they received nano vesicles. Mm -hmm. So vesicles of any type from early onset preeclampsia enhances the contractile response to uh, phenylephrine. And we, um, and we can see that the late onset preeclampsia group appeared yeah, to not, not um, I am listening to Journal Club. Sorry, I can hear you, Matt. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the late onset preeclampsia group um, 
showed little uh, response to um, little difference compared to the non-intensive animals and in the phenylephrine animals, oh, sorry, in the nanovesicle injected animals, um, it sits somewhere in between er, what we see with early onset preeclampsia and uh, with normal pregnancies. So that's the phenylephrine response. If we look at the endothelin one response, um, we get larger responses um, to endothelin one. Once again, then uh, we've got early onset preeclampsia showing a uh, increase in both the low, lowest uh, response to lowest doses and the highest doses when injected with um, early on macrovesicles from early onset preeclampsia. It increased the maximal uh, response generated to endothelin one when injected with microvesicles. And then again, um, and then again, there was a difference when injected um, with nanovesicles. However, the sub uh, analysis was not able to uh, determine how it's changed, whether it's the maximal, the minimal, or the sensitivity that has changed in nanovesicle group. So. That was the vasoconstrictor in the in one um, and in both vasoconstrictors that I've shown here, we show, we show that um, early onset preeclampsia induces a more proconstrictor phenotype. But what about the um, vasodilators? Does it change the, vasodil uh, the response to vasodilators? Um, again, Again, yes, we see that when you inject um, animals with macro, micro, and or nanovesicles from early onset preeclampsia, it seems to have reduced the uh, possible vasodilation with a um, with a dose of um, acetylcholine. Again, here, even though it seems that early onset uh, just resulted in upshift of the curve, we didn't actually, the sub um, analysis weren't able to tell us exactly what was different with this line. Um, but in microvesicles, we could see that um, in the lowest uh, doses, we saw little to no response to acetylcholine if you're if in animals that received microvesicles from early onset preeclamptic placenta and again um, very a little or no response in animals that received um, nanovesicles from early onset pre preeclamptic placenta and um, what was interesting from this was we could see in microvesicles that the eight that the animals injected with late onset preeclamptic um, micro uh, from animals injected with microvesicles from late onset preeclamptic placenta um, showed a uh, enhanced response to acetylcholine, which was um, especially at the lowest doses. So after the second dose, you get um, a large drop, which was not expected. So that is um, the relax vessel relaxation through stimulating the generation of nitric oxide via ENOS. But what happens if you just dump, essentially dump nitric oxide into, uh, in with the blood vessels? What would be the sodium nitroprusside response be? Um, so actually the response is very similar to um, if you gave um, acetylcholine what you get is a reduced response in all three vesicle types if they come from early onset preeclamptic placenta, an enhanced uh, relaxation if um, you injected with late onset microvesicles. Um, but the, res the difference between acetylcholine and nit sodium nitroprusside is it's uh, the sub analysis revealed it's not the minimum response that has changed, but that the entire curve has right shifted so that there is a um, the EC50, the point where a 50% relaxation response is generated. Um, it requires 
is right shifted, meaning you need more drug to produce the same uh, relaxation, meaning that the sensitivity to nitric oxide has decreased in these animals. Um, after micro and sorry, micro and macro vesicles, but um, not confirmed with the nano vesicles. So that was a lot of data. How would I have summarized this in an easy way? Um, I would say that from what I've seen so far, early onset preeclamptic placental vesicles actually uh, results in a proconstrictive phenotype that we see in women with pre early onset preeclampsia. So you get increase in response to um, vasoconstrictors, which is bad, and decreased response to vasodilators, which is also bad. However, um, with late onset preeclamptic placental EVs, on par, everything appears to be neutral. Neutral. It doesn't appear to be significantly different from normotensive placental EVs, except that um, in response to nanovesicles, you get an increase in response to vasoconstrictors, and um, which is more proconstrictive. Then at the same time, it could potentially be offset by an increase in response to vasodilators. So it can dilate, uh, relax more and contract more at the same time. So in summary, uh, this work is the first to show that placental EVs from the third trimester placenta directly affects the maternal vascular resistance. And normal third trimester placenta may actually be contributing to the more relaxed vasculature seen in pregnancy compared to the non-pregnant state when you don't have a placenta. And that the effects of early onset preeclamptic uh, EVs appears to be different to the late onset uh, preeclamptic EVs where in early onset preeclampsia, the placental EVs can, uh, can reduce result in the something that mimics what um, the cardio the blood vessels of women with preeclampsia have um, what their phenotype is and in late onset preeclampsia the effects are a bit mixed um, the microvesicles appear to be enhancing vessel relaxation, which is good, but the nanovesicles appear to enhance vessel contraction, which is bad. And we know, again, we know in pregnancy that the amount of uh, microvesicles and nanovesicles released from a placenta is approximately equal. So why do we actually see a difference? Well, it could possibly be that um, actually in early onset preeclamps, the, the etiology is different. So the placenta is actually, uh, an, uh, pre there is a placental insult to the placenta, uh, sorry. There is an initial insult to the placenta, which could potentially change what is actually the EVs actually released from the placenta, whereas late onset preeclampsia doesn't necessarily have that initial insult. Therefore, the um, EVs being released from a late onset preeclamptic placenta may not all, be all that different from uh, a normal, teen, normal pregnancy and therefore potentially explaining the better fetal and maternal outcomes. Um, so it would be interesting to actually have a head-on comparison about what the difference between the um, EVs released from these placenta are, whereas what we've done so far is only look at um, essentially an echo of their function. So the, uh, there are a few limitations of this work. So um, with why myography, what we're doing is I've shown you that we've taken um, a couple of segments of isolated blood vessels from the mesenteric, so um, mesentery, and changes of vascular resistance um, can actually be buffered by other cardiovascular controllers that are not present in this model. Um, of using a YMI graph, such as the vessel tone is or con uh, 
the tonal state, the contractile basal tone, is actually controlled by the, uh, the autonomic nervous system. So it's controlled centrally by sympathetic nerve activity. And increasing or decreasing sympathetic nerve activity could actually change the basal tone. And we don't know whether or not that the with sympathetic nerve activity input, whether the changes we see here will still be valid. So not only do we not know that this is exactly what it is in an animal, but we're not also uh, taking into account that um, a change in vascular resistance is not the same as a change in blood pressure. So you can have uh, changes in the heart rate and um, the injection fraction of the heart that actually can buffer changes. So for example, if you've got an increase in vascular resistance, you could just let the blood pool a bit more in your um, venous system and pump less, heart, uh, less blood by the heart to the arterial system and maintain a, good, a relatively normal blood pressure. So we're not looking at this um, in our work current, in this uh, work that I've shown you currently. And we've also given these animals a single bolus injection. So we don't know whether or not um, the effect of slow, consistent delivery, such as via an osmotic pump or mechanical pumps can change this. Um, and uh, remember initially, in, I showed you 30 minute and 24 hour responses and to normal um, third trimester placenta, and those responses are different. So what would be the balance be, um, if we had, you know, continuously uh, vesicles that have been released for 30 minutes versus vesicles that have been released for 24 hours? Do they cancel each other out? Is there still a response? We, we don't really know that. Um, and, and when we give a bolus injection, um, yes, we've injected 100 micrograms worth of, um, of protein, but by the time 24 hours come along, a lot of that vesicles um, or vesicular protein that we've injected into these animals would have been cleared um, via, for example, the um, hepatobiliary system or via um, the, the uh, kidneys and release through the urine. So we don't know, you know, actually we might not be seeing the full effect because most of these vesicles are cleared, they're not in the system. And one last thing is we're looking at a really short-term response. We're looking at the acute responses and we're looking at short-term responses. Now human pregnancy is that, well, it's nine months, um, hopefully it's like nine months. So what happens in the long term, what happens when you get um, long term exposure to these vesicles? Do the effects that we see, uh, is that normalized? Like, does the body adapt to it so that the re um, responses we see aren't like they're a lot more dampened with repeated exposure, or is it still as strong? Um, we don't know. So with that, um, I conclude my presentation today and I'd love to say a huge thank you for your time for um, listening to me rambling on about um, what I'm really interested in. Um, I'd like to thank the team, uh, Professor Larry Chamley, Dr. Carolyn Barrett, Associate Professor Katie Graham, Associate Professor Chi Chen. Um, some of the control data was actually, um, a lot of my control data from the First, uh, third trimester pl normal placenta was actually done by my student Sharon Chung. Um, thanks to uh, te the labs of um, both labs, both teams, um, the VJU staff who have mated all my uh, animals for me. Um, thank you to the um, midwives which go around consenting women with preeclampsia and making sure that we have access to such a valuable sample and the uh Obzagain team in um auckland city hospital which um makes sure that they call us when a preeclamptic placenta is delivered even if it's late at night and thanks heaps to the study participants because without preeclamptic placenta none of this work could be done and this, um, oh, this work has been supported by the um, Health Research Council of New Zealand. And a pretty background 
um, taken from the Ansborough uh, website of what um, macro vesicles look like. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Sandy, for this great and very detailed talk. Um, we're open for discussion. Any questions? Comments? I do have a couple of questions. So, uh, Sandy, I was wondering uh, when you said that uh, the long term uh, studies would be interesting and to, to follow up. Uh, how long do you think you can do these experiments with mice for? So, uh, mice remain pregnant for, for about 20 days. So, they deliver about, they, uh, sort of between day 20 and 21, um, depending on the strain. Um, and they, but they don't implant into the uterus and for, until about day 5.5. So, really, if you um, try to do a long-term experiment, the maximum you can get out of a mouse would be... Um, 15 days. Mm -hmm. And also, um, I was really curious, like, what would you say would be the major contributor in terms of the packages of these vesicles to, to get the response, uh, response you get? Um, do you mean the major, the main protein or? Oh, protein, RNA. What would be is the, the main participants that plays this uh, crucial role in the response? Um, I, don't, one. I don't necessarily know what is it, what it is inside these vesicles that have this response. Um, I know that there would be um, some DNA in there. There would be a lot of protein in there and some lipids, um, mm -hmm. probably RNA. But um, we're sort of not at the point where we've actually done any sort of mechanic mechanistic digging of what it is about these vesicles. So um, this is sort of the first time that we've shown that it's even um, that these vesicles actually have this response to on the uh, blood vessels. So in the future, um, I guess, going forward, we would be looking at what the differences are. Um, I think proteins would be um, proteins could possibly contribute to the acute 30 minute responses um, because there wouldn't necessarily be time for a de novo protein synthesis within the blood vessels. Uh, but when you're looking at 24 hours, it could be a mixture of uh, proteins or it could be RNA that's been transcribed into proteins. Um, but for example, if there was a particular protein that led to the um, the transcription of another protein. So um, it could also, you know, have happened within this time frame. So uh, yeah, it's, I'm not necessarily sure, but I think proteins would be a good, some protein would have been a good um, bet. Mm -hmm. Especially the comparison of nano vesicles with micro, uh, because you are getting this uh, opposite reaction to them. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, there was a previous PhD student in Larry's lab, whom a lot of you would know, Mansi. She did a proteomics comparison between micro and nano and macro vesicles, um, but this was first trimester placenta. So we're look, potentially looking at very different vesicles here. But um, with what I've seen in the first trimester placenta proteomics, um, the vast majority of the proteins are shared across these 
three different types of um, vesicles. Um, and what is different, nothing actually really jumps up to me when I look through um, the list. It could be because I know very little about all the proteins um, that were in the different list, um, but the vast majority of them are the same. So it is quite interesting that um, the different vesicle types have an effect uh, in late onset preeclamptic placenta, um, whereas they're all, they all seem to be doing the same thing in early onset preeclamptic placenta. Um, but uh, the, so far the first trimester placenta proteomics hasn't hasn't got anything that jumped out of the page for me that could account for this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Let me check the chat. No, it's empty. If we don't have any other questions, so we will thank uh, Sandy one more time for your time and for your amazing presentation. We we'll learned a lot again. Um, from your talk about placenta vesicles today. Um, I would like to remind everyone that uh, we are at monthly uh, schedule at the moment, so we will meet again next uh, month. We don't have a speaker for the next um, uh, journal club, so um, you're very welcome to present. If you wish to, uh, just email me um, and we would be happy to to host you at our journal club. Um, I would like to thank everyone for your time and for joining us today and we will see you all uh, next month. Thank you. Bye-bye.